I would speak to you this morning a little while on the idea of Christians only. Christians only. For a good many years, there were some who were saying that we, the Church of Christ, are not the only Christians, but that we are Christians only. Essential to this given study is that we all have in mind the same thing that is designated by the word Christian. One who has obeyed the gospel of Christ from the heart. But we must understand what it is to obey the gospel of Christ. It involves hearing and understanding the seed of the kingdom, which is the word of God, the gospel message. It involves having trust or faith or confidence or belief formed in Jesus Christ and the things of God by that message, Romans 10, 17. Faith is essential to salvation, according to the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Thus, our faith must be based upon the truth of God's Word and only on the truth of God's Word. In that truth, having believed in Christ, we are commanded to repent of our sins, Acts 17.30. One does not repent of one's sins, still ignorant of Jesus Christ, and the things that he who has all authority, which is Christ, declares to us, that we must do to obtain the remission of those sins. Thus Jesus will say in Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You will notice, too, that besides belief and repentance, one must confess one's belief or faith in Christ, that He is the only begotten Son of God. Romans 10, 10, Matthew 10, 32. Having done that, one is scripturally qualified to complete his or her obedience to the gospel by being immersed in water to the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is all by the authority of Christ, to obtain the remission of past sins. Acts 2, verse 38. That's what they did on the day the church started, and that's what anyone has to do until the end of time from that day forward. So when I use the word Christian, I mean one who is of Christ, one who has obeyed the gospel. Now those on the day of Pentecost where they obeyed the gospel, the Lord himself added them to his church. Colossians 1 and verse 18 says the body is the church, thus the church is the body. In Ephesians chapter 4 says there's one body. Well, if the body is the church and the church is the body, then he says there's one body. There's one church that Jesus Christ of Nazareth built. And you know, that's exactly what he promised to do in Matthew 16, 18. Upon this rock, I will build my C-H-U-R-C-H church, singular. So when I speak of being a Christian, I'm talking about the word Christian as it is defined and used in the New Testament of Jesus Christ. But the other thing I would add to this is that once one is baptized into Christ, <clears throat> he must live in harmony with the teaching of the New Testament. Remember, as we quote so often, Colossians 3.17 was written to members of the church. And while it's true of everybody on earth that they would be saved by Christ, it was still originally written to members of the church. Thus, once one becomes a member of the church, as we've studied already, that person must continue to abide under the authority of Christ as set out in the words of the New Testament pertaining to Christian living. He must live in harmony with the teaching of the New Testament in matters of religious practice. And, of course, that would also co cover moral conduct. Now, that's a brief definition of what I mean by Christian. And thus, when people say we're not the only Christians but are Christians only, I want to look at that. And I want to look at the word Christian 
as it's used in the New Testament by the inspired writers. Now, going further with this, I want to point out some things which we are not discussing. We're not discussing whether there are honest people or good moral people scattered throughout the denominations. We're not talking about that at all. We're not discussing whether one may be scripturally baptized by a denominational preacher. We're not discussing whether it's possible for one in the private study of the Bible to learn what to do to be saved and from the heart obey the gospel without ever coming into contact with a gospel preacher or any other preacher. And when I say gospel preacher, I mean a member of the church as we noted a while ago. Admittedly, let me emphasize that, admittedly, this could happen. And no doubt, it has happened. But that's not what we're discussing right now. We're not discussing whether such as I've just mentioned might have joined the denomination after the baptism. Well, while such could happen, probably has happened, and may happen again, it doesn't happen all that often, and certainly does not justify affirming, as some do, that there are sincere, knowledgeable, devout Christians scattered among the denominations. To build on that, the fact that such may have happened, may have happened, does not justify the charge we, the church, are sectarian when we insist that in the New Testament times, I'll use that because I think that lets us know what time I'm speaking about, the first century, when the church was established, as the New Testament was being revealed, and so on, as you read about in your New Testament. In New Testament times, there were not Christians in denominations. Good reason for that. There weren't any denominations. When you read the scriptures in your own Bible, which you bought and studied to learn God's will for your own life, because you want to go to heaven and you know it'll be pleasing to God the way you do that. You don't want to lose your soul in a devil's hell, and you know the people who go to heaven are the people who love the Lord and keep his commandments. You realize then that when we admit as all do, that there were no denominations back in the first century when the New Testament was being revealed, confirmed by the Holy Spirit through miracles, signs, and wonders, and written down by inspired men. We know that those saved by Jesus then were added by him to his own blood-bought church, Acts 2, 47, Acts 20, and verse 28. And that's all we have. There was no apostasy of the first three centuries after the first century. There was no Roman Catholic Church or just Catholic Church forming out of that apostasy. There was no division in about 1100 between the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches. There was no Protestant Reformation as there was around 14 or especially 1500 and 1600. None of that was the case. People were simply Christians, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else, added to the church that Jesus built when they obeyed the gospel, and they were known as simply Christians. They were of Christ. Now, what this shows is that it is certainly possible to be saved and not to be in any denomination. Most of the people believing in Jesus today don't even understand that. They don't even understand the beginning of it because they can't see 
Christianity as it appears on the pages of the New Testament. They see what appears on the pages of the New Testament through the strongly colored glasses of denominationalism. And they only think that's Christianity. They don't think a church can exist without being a denomination. But here's the point. As far as I know, that a person, as is true, and you read your New Testament, as it reveals, could be saved and was saved and not belong to any denomination. Now mark it down. Denominational preachers today generally agree to that point. I suggest you ask any preacher of any denomination. Now, I know I don't know all of them, so there could be variations, but the most of them. Let's say you ask the preacher of denomination A. Just ask him, do you believe one can be a Christian and not be a member of your denomination? I promise you he's going to answer. If he answers honestly, he's going to say yes. Then this question, does becoming a Christian make one a member of your denomination? I can guarantee you what he'll say. He'll say no. Because the concept of denominationalism is that no one denomination is the whole. They have no concept of that when it comes to understanding the denominations of which they are members. Now, what I've just said is not the same as saying one can become a Christian and not be a member of the church Jesus built, the church of Christ as it's used and defined in the New Testament, such as the churches of Christ salute you. Holy Spirit, had Paul write that, they didn't know anything about denominations. Some people have said, well, he was talking about all the different denominations that make up the churches of Christ. They didn't know about anything like that because it didn't exist. They are 1,500 years before the first Protestant denomination ever was on the earth. They're several hundred years before Roman Catholicism or Catholicism in general appeared. If you're going to understand the Bible, you must understand what they would understand, not take over what we see and plug it in as if they're right where we are today. They had no concept of a Protestant so-called denominational church. In fact, the denominations today don't really understand Protestant part of their terminology. Protestant meant that they were formed because they were protesting the corruption in the Roman Catholic Church. And thus they were Protestant. They were protesting. Most denominations have no idea of that because they don't protest much of anything except getting their way. Now you say, well, that's awful bold. Well, look around you. Why should there be denominationalism except somebody says I like to do it this way and you like to do it that way and they like to do it this way and after all it doesn't make any difference what you believe just so you're sincere we're all heading for the same place that's been around a long time but you can't find that in your New Testament it's not there the New Testament does not teach men to join or to even form a denomination well guess what this is also admitted by preachers and denominations. You realize we go down through here, they're admitting they're doing things not found in the New Testament. Now that being the case, the only reason we have denominations in the world is because men have left the teaching of the New Testament. Already the answer to these few questions that denominational preachers are asked and will answer as I gave them, at least in the most part, say that, well, we're not doing what we know the New Testament did or they did in the church recorded in the New Testament. The only way one can join a denomination, it's very simple, is by leaving the teaching of the New Testament. Because they will admit what we do is not taught in the New Testament. That's the way they did it in the first century. Most of the time, they try to explain away why you don't have to do it like they did. And there's where they have a problem with Bible authority and New Testament authority. Colossians 3.17 still reads, Paul writing to members of the church to keep the church faithful to Christ. It's his church covered by his blood. He added the members to it in their obedience to the gospel. They were to do all things by the name of Christ, by his authority. 
Now, if every member of the church in the first century and those to follow after had lived according to Colossians 3.17, there never would have been an apostasy. There never would have been a Catholic church. Thus, there never would have been an Eastern Orthodox division of the Catholic church, the Roman Catholic church. There wouldn't have been all these denominations. If they just done what the New Testament says and they admit that the New Testament teaches, they would be the Lord's church. Doesn't mean troubles wouldn't ride in it, but they would all appeal to the authority of Christ to solve those problems. So does it not also follow that all denominations will be abolished when all religious people return to the teaching of the New Testament? If everyone who says, God is my Father, the Bible is the infallible Word of God, and Jesus is my Savior, if we would all do just what the New Testament taught, because we already admit what I've already pointed out to you, then when everybody would do that, there would be no human denominations on this earth. People would just be Christians. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else, the members of the church Jesus built. Because that's the way it was when you read Acts 2 and all through the New Testament. Those who adhere to the teaching of the New Testament, and I want to emphasize this, though you've probably gotten it already, are not in denominations. Now, one may disagree, but does this not follow from what we've already noted, that they will admit that the New Testament does not lead people to join denominations? Let me ask you this. If the New Testament, the teaching of the New Testament, does not lead people to join denominations, to where does it lead them? Wouldn't it lead them to the same institution to which Christ added those on the first day of Pentecost, first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ? Wouldn't that be his church? Church he purchased with his blood? Church of which he is the only head? One cannot get into denomination while strictly adhering to the New Testament. You just can't do it. Not only is that the case, but the denominations, while claiming, I underscore the word claiming, while claiming to adhere to the New Testament, do not, I say they do not do so in reference to the following matters. They don't do so as to the purpose and place of baptism or even the mode of baptism. They take liberties. They'll sprinkle water on you. They'll pour water on you. It's a matter of your decision. Or some, I guess, will say, we don't even have to practice baptism. When I was in Van Buren, Arkansas, all the disciples of Christ, which was liberal before liberal was cool, the preacher called me up one day, wanted me to be a part of the ministerial alliance, and I explained to him as calmly and nice as I could why I would not be. And lo and behold, I found out not long thereafter that they had a baptismal ceremony and he baptized them with rose petals. Why not? You can depart from the teaching of the New Testament on any one point. You can depart on every other point. I don't see any difference in getting baptized or, as he would call it, sprinkled with rose petals and getting water sprinkled on you. Might even be cleaner according to where he got the water. So the purpose and place of baptism. It's very important. Of course, the Roman Catholic Church says the water must be blessed by a priest. So it's called holy water. You can't find anything like that in your Bible. It's not there. What about the observance of the Lord's Supper? We do it just about any time we get ready. That's what most of the denominations say. They do it all sorts of times. <coughs> they call it things it's not. <laughs> Acts 20 and 7. The Lord's Supper is in memory of Christ's death. And we partake of it until he come again. It's probable, Albert Barnes says in his commentary, that's an old commentary, that the apostles and early Christians celebrated the Lord's Supper on every Lord's Day. I'll raise this question. If he wasn't a member of the Lord's Church, where'd you get that idea? Because when you read your New Testament, the determination to learn about the Lord's Church, to which he adds all the saved, and where Christians were found in the first century, the only, play, only day you can find the Lord's Supper being observed was in the assembly of the saints in Acts 20 and 7. And they were taught to do that by an inspired apostle. Think that'll work today? Seems pretty secure message to me. Then I write, uh, and I've used this comment here a lot over the years. There's a new edited version. I don't like it as well as do the old one. But pulpit commentary. 
Here's what they say. This is also an important example of weekly communion as the practice of the first Christians. Where do you get that idea? How do you know that's the practice of the first Christians? Well, if it wasn't for the New Testament, you would. And if it wasn't for Acts 27, you would. Adam Clark, which is even an older commentary, a Methodist commentator, uh, Adam Clark wrote, intimating by this that they were accustomed to receive, and he calls it the Holy Sacrament, on each Lord's Day. I ask you, these were considered for many years and still are as eminent scholars and people that I know of, all sorts of people have their commentaries. Where did they get the idea that the brethren of the first century Observe the Lord's Supper on the first of the week. Somebody said, well, because they did, must we? You want to be sure that you do. If you don't want to be sure, don't do anything like the Bible says. If you don't want to be sure, just don't believe in God. After all, a host of people don't. And a whole host of folks think they're very religious. They don't believe Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God. And a whole host of those that do believe in God and the Bible and Jesus Christ don't believe there's one church. So where did these guys get this idea, these eminent scholars of centuries back? It had to come from the Bible. There's no other source, specifically the New Testament. What about the use of mechanical instruments of music or other kinds of music other than simply singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs? They admit it can't be found in the New Testament. All the arguments pertaining to try to justify their use of mechanical instruments of music is try to say, well, you don't have to really do what the New Testament says. And so what happens is people just simply reject the restoration principle, which means it's the seed principle. <coughs> and everything produces after its kind. If you sow the seed of the kingdom, what can it produce in honest good hearts? Luke 8, 15. But the kingdom. <coughs> and since the kingdom is the church and the church is the kingdom, Colossians 1, 18, then, of course, if you do the same thing today, you'll have today what they had then. You see how simple that is? But people like doing it their way you know that song I did it my way that's always been the problem the will of man their traditions their likes and dislikes what mom and daddy did what grandpa Amos did or whatever else truth of the matter is we're interested in doing what the Bible says <coughs> if there are Christians in denominations we'll give you a bit of advice get out and the sooner the better because they have no authority from Jesus Christ to exist. They found it on men and upon their commandments and doctrines. <clears throat> and we've already seen a great many of their preachers will say, well, no, the early church didn't do this. But we do. I simply ask this question, should a person remain in a place where he cannot stand for and practice that which is taught in the Bible? Why should I want to do that? If I were to ask any member who acknowledges the Bible as the Word of God of a denomination, should you stand in a place where people don't do what the Bible says? Well, they're going to say no. But they do because they don't know how to apply that very point. Should one be in something one can't get into except by leaving the New Testament? Well, somebody may say, the Church of Christ is a denomination. You just don't want to admit it, just like all the other denominations. Well, I'm asking you to go back to the infallible Word of God that it was without error. I'm saying we can be what they were, and they were not a member of the denomination. If you're going to say that, well, you follow after this preacher or that preacher, then the Ethiopian eunuch would not have been a Christian. Why did I say that? Well, who taught him the gospel? Philip did, so he'd been a Philippite. Paul seemed to get very upset over people in the beginning of divisions in the church at Corinth when he pointed out them. Some say you're of Peter, and some of Paul, and some of Christ. Christ crucified for you, or rather, is Peter crucified for you? What was he nipping at? The very early, 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 first beginning to appear divisions in the church. And he nipped it in the bud, to use Barney Fife's famous quotation. 
You can't read 1 Corinthians 1 and 10 and understand it and say division is all right with God. You cannot read the prayer of Jesus for unity, that we all might be one even as he is Father or one. Look at the denominational scene. He said that's, that's what Jesus was praying for. If that's the case, then those of us in the Lord's church need to remain and those in human denominations need to get out of them and just be Christians only and only Christians. If that's the case, then those of us who have, whoever that may be, left the New Testament authority to do as you please need to understand you've done just exactly the thing that makes denominations begin. But the church of Christ, as I say again, that term is used in the New Testament by inspired writers, as it's defined, is not a denomination. I say as I did a moment ago, no denomination as we know them today existed till 1,500 years after the day of Pentecost where the Lord started his church and gave the terms of entrance into it. Now, if you can show, and I certainly hope people would love me enough to do that, for I or any members of the Church of Christ have departed from the authority of Christ and what we believe in practice. I want to know because I can't go to heaven unless I abide in the doctrine of Christ. So John said in 2 John 8 through 10, I must abide in the doctrine of Christ. That's where all spiritual blessings are located by God. Ephesians 1 verse 3, forgiveness of sins being one of them. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 1, 7. That was written to Christians, not to denominations, but to Christians. That once they're baptized into Christ, in the waters of baptism, as it were, the blood of Christ was applied. Thus they could rise from that watery grave, a new creature in Christ. And that are remaining Christ by abiding by his authorized word concerning how they live the Christian life. Now I want to close with this. It was said in the days the Jews were on this earth before the church was ever established. But the truth of it applies always. Jesus said, every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Matthew 15, 13. He said what he meant. And he meant what he said. Originally, to the Jews to whom he said it and their problems, but it's an axiom and it's applicable to the end of the world. If God did not plant, as it were, the church of which you are a member, through people hearing the word and obeying the gospels we've studied, and the Lord added those people to the church, then you don't need to be a part of it. It's not accepted by God, and he will root it up. I've tried to make this lesson about as fundamental and clear as I can. And here's the thing that's so sad about it. We have gone so long, so many hundreds of years, involving ourselves and being around denominationalism, that the simplicity of the truth is just beyond most people. But that's what denominationalism does. That's why the devil wants it, because he can blind people. We can talk about all manner of things going on in the world and morals and so forth. But one of the greatest tools the devil has ever come up with to destroy souls is denominationalism. It makes people feel good, and they think they're right. So much so, they will not compare their beliefs and practices with the New Testament. And yet their preachers will even admit so many things the New Testament church at the first century wasn't doing, but we are. If you're not a child of God, we studied this morning how to become one. It's the only way to become one because it's the way it's set out in the New Testament. I don't care to set out anything else. I'm just a mere man. I'm, why would I want to set out anything but what you can read in your own Bible? It's there for you to read and understanding it, believe it, and comply with it. Child of God, I can only preach the second law of pardon that you need to repent of any sins you've committed, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. I have no right to preach anything else. Well, I don't like it. Well, I can go somewhere else, but that's what I'm going to preach. Or as Brother Wallace said one time, you may not like it, but you haven't heard the last of it. I have to because I'm going to stand someday before Jesus Christ himself. 
as you are, all by my lonesome, and give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. It's not worth losing my soul over because I upset somebody. In fact, I can't find many people who were ever converted to Christ that they weren't upset when they heard the truth and exposed their error and they had to come to grips with it. So what is your case this morning? Are you abiding in the doctrine of Christ or something else? If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we humbly ask you to come while we stand and sing.